All right, all right, all right. Let's welcome all of the campuses with us today. Nine campuses, one church, one location, or one church, many locations. And uh, we welcome all of you to this worship experience today. Hey, as we get two weeks out from Easter, I want to just talk to you about our goals for Easter Sunday morning. We have a heart and a passion to reach people for Jesus. Amen? Yes. Reach. What's the second part of our vision? Teach. Teach. Third, release. release. Fully devoted followers. Oh, my Lord, you're going to hear a word about that today. But before we get into the word, I want to just share with you some global goals for the movement. And we're calling them prayer goals. We're calling them what, church? Because we're asking you to join us in praying for these. Now, you're going to see a lot on the screen because there's it's lots of campuses, but I just want to draw your eyes down to the bottom. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. If you look across the movement, and this does not include online. Well, yeah, it does include online. It doesn't include a few of our worshiping venues. But our attendance goals that we have for Easter weekend is 9,475 people. Wouldn't it be great if God would send us, if we go out and, and care for people and invite people, that God would send us close to 10,000 people on Easter weekend? Come on, can I get an amen? amen. Or a hand clap. <laughs> First time guest, if we go out and continue to spread the word and invite people and bring people with us, we're praying that we will see somewhere around 474 first time guests Easter weekend. And here's the big enchilada. We're hoping and praying that if God would be so kind to us, we would see 758 people or thereabouts cross over from death to life and receive the gospel good news of Jesus Christ. That's our prayer. So pray for that and uh, we will see what God does in two weeks. Amen? Hey, I want to introduce to you a dear friend of mine. Uh, his name is Pastor Don Wilson, and uh, quite often you guys will hear me talk about this tribe that I'm a part of. It's about 14 guys, and uh, we get together a couple times a year, and, and they're, they're, my, they're my people. They're my friends. They, they were in similar stages, leading similar churches, and um, they're just a real blessing in my life. And one of the, the men in our group is um, Pastor Don Wilson. And uh, he's from Phoenix, Arizona. Not originally. I'll talk about that, that in just a moment. But he led a church there called Christ Church of the Valley. And not only is he in my tribe today, what you wouldn't know if I didn't tell you this, is that I first met Don in the year 2000. I was in the Beeson program at Asbury Theological Seminary studying, getting ready to start New Hope Church. We traveled around the world studying the best of the best churches. And my mentor, Dale Galloway, took me to Christ Church of the Valley where I first met Don Wilson. And so in a very real sense, Don's fingerprints are all over New Hope. He really uh, influenced me greatly back in the year 2000. And as God would have it, now I get to do life with him uh, and, a, and a larger group of men. He grew up in Kansas, in rural Kansas, in a church of 100 people. He played basketball, and he coached basketball. Oh, speaking of basketball, <laughs> wouldn't it be great? I mean, come on, come on. In North Carolina Central University made it to the big dance this year. Come on, celebrate them. Celebrate them. Praise God. That was awesome. They're building a program, but they're gone. They're gone. They lost. No, no, see, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not picking on them. North Carolina State, they made it. See ya. They're gone. Okay, there's two teams left in North Carolina, just two teams. And I don't know if you figured this out yet, but if you study the bracket, there's a chance. <laughs> there's a chance that University of North Carolina. I told you. University of North Carolina and Duke could. People. They, they could, they could end up in the national championship together on Monday, April 2nd. And right now you feel that in the room. You don't know whether to clap for that or whether that would be a bad thing. I brought this up to my kids the other day and one of them said, Daddy, I don't know. 
He said, I, I think that would cause a civil war in North Carolina. <laughs> and I know God has far more important things to do than worry about basketball. I get it. But Lord, if it's possible, <laughs> I would love to see a national championship between North Carolina and Duke. Glory to God. Should we pray about it? No. <laughs> hey, um, so check it out. He played basketball. He coached basketball. Maybe that's one of the reasons why I respect him so much because he, he's just got that coach spirit to him. And you guys know that I coach my kids. Um, their church, CCV, in Arizona started in a house just like our church did. So we have that connection as well. They went 15 years before they ever owned a piece of property. But I would have you know that he recently retired. And when he walked out of the door of CCV, that was a church of 28,000 people made up of nine. Yeah, you can celebrate that because people matter to God. People matter to God. 28,000 people with nine campuses. And as we were sitting together last night having dinner, it was, it was, I was blown away by this comment, and I love it. He said, you know what? But my greatest joy is not leading a large church. My greatest joy is that I've been married to my wife for 50 years. I have, you hear all the women? Oh, <laughs> Married for 50 years, check this out, and all of his children, he has three children, they're all in ministry. That's a win. That's a win. And Don would not say this, but I will say it because it is true. In the United States of America, in the latter part of the 20th century and now in the first part of the 21st century, Don Wilson is a legend in growing a God-honoring, Bible-believing, Jesus-exalting, prevailing church. And you are blessed beyond measure to have him stand on this stage today and teach you a message that I just want to go ahead and warn you will have an edge to it. Who wants God to speak to them even if it's not comfortable? And uh, I took so many notes in the first service that was just incredible. I want you to do what you always do. I told them how you are with guest speakers. I want you to show honor where honor is due and uh, celebrate and welcome Pastor Don Wilson to the stage of New Hope. Thank you, buddy. Love you. Thank you. Anybody can clap. Let's take an offering for the pat. No, just hang in there. Okay. Uh, honored to be here. Uh, Benji and Amy, great friends, and my wife and I, and we've had a chance to do life together with them, and our new ministry is basically uh, pouring into pastors and wives. We found out that 90 per, 80 to 90% of pastors quit in the first five years of ministry. It's tragic. You know why that is? Because uh, you guys are in a great church. You're in a growing church. 65% of churches in America today are either declining or plateaued. They're not reaching lost people. And to be a part of a vibrant church on all the campuses that are impacting your communities for Jesus Christ, I want you to know that's incredible and you need to, you need to rejoice in that because you're seeing lives changed every week. The little country church I grew up in, if we had two decisions for Christ in a year, it was a, it was a big deal. And that was probably some parents' kids that had to go forward, you know, and, and keep it going. But that's the kind of church that I grew up in. And I said, if we're ever going to impact the world for Jesus Christ, we've got to have churches that are more on fire, more on fire for God. Uh, I've never had an introduction like that in my life. Most of it's not true, but the ones that was, I'll take it. All right. Uh, you know, uh, I just turned 70. And, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. It reminded me of the four old guys were getting together. And they said, you know what, let's go down to that restaurant close by because they have, they're 50. They said they have some good-looking waitresses. <laughs> and 10 years later for their 60th birthdays, they all got together and said, let's go to that restaurant close by. They have really good food. <laughs> then they had their 70th birthday and they said, let's go to that restaurant close by. They have really good wheelchair ramps. <laughs> Then they turned 80. They said, you know what? Let's go to that restaurant close by. We've never been there before. 
And so uh, that, that's, I don't know how I am, but that's kind of, kind of, kind of where it's at, okay? And so uh, anyway, I'm honored to be here. I want to I wanna share with you a message, and I got the idea from a book I read several years ago by Dr. Bruce Wilkerson entitled Experiencing Spiritual Breakthrough. And they did some research and survey to find out why aren't we having spiritual breakthrough in, in different parts of the world, especially in the United States. Because, you know, really, um, Charlotte is one of the most churched cities in America. Montgomery, Alabama, one of the most churched cities in America. North Carolina is one of the most churched uh, states in the Union. Where I administered in Phoenix, Arizona, 90% of the people don't go to church. So the question that I want to, to, to pose before you on all of our campuses is simply this. Why is it with so many people going to church, so many people uh, calling themselves Christians, that the morals in our culture are moving farther and farther away from Jesus Christ? Something has got to change. Something is not right. And so uh, what I want to talk to you today is about three different chairs that represent Three different kinds of spiritual growth. And the, the, on your program there, it's blank for you to write down whatever you want, okay? And I want to encourage you to write some things down. And what I want to do is begin by giving you a spiritual, a biblical background for where we're going to try to set up these different chairs. The first scripture is in Joshua 24, verse 14 through 16. You can write that down. It said this, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable for you, then choose for yourselves who you will serve. But Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Okay? And he was a first chair. We're going to look at these as a first chair, a second chair, and a third chair. And the first chair was Joshua. And you might write the word down. The first chair, they lived it. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord all in. This is what we're about. The next scripture is in Judges chapter 2, verse 6. It says, The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who had outlived them and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Notice the difference? Joshua lived it. The next generation didn't live it, but they saw their parents live it. So in chair two, right, we've seen it. We lived it, we've seen it. Judges chapter two, verse 10 says, after that generation, a whole generation had died, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Why didn't they not know the Lord or what he had done? Because that generation lived it, this generation talked about it, or this generation had seen it, but this generation had never seen it or talked about it. It was totally foreign to them. I want to use another Old Testament example of three generations, King David, King Solomon, and King Rehoboam. The scripture basically says this in 1 Kings eleven fourteen. 14. It says, as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart to other gods and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. Okay, what do we notice there? The message translation said, uh, Solomon did not follow completely. Your church is concerned about what? Making fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. All right, let me give you one more scripture. 1 Kings 12, 6. After Solomon came his son Rehoboam, and it says, But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. In other words, he didn't even listen to the godly men that his father listened to. He said, I'm going to listen to my friends tell me what I want to hear, not what I need to hear. All right, so if you're taking notes, let's look at how this plays out. First of all, David had a devoted heart. Write the word devoted heart down. What do you mean? It says David was fully devoted to God. Well, what's a fully devoted heart mean? A fully devoted heart simply means that we put God first. There it is, God first. 
And every decision we make, we say, what would God do? And we try to put, we desire to put God first. Solomon, on the other hand, had a divided heart. And this is where so many Christians are in our churches today. And as you think about this, what I want you to see today is what chair are you sitting in? This divided heart is a Christian who what? Lives for themselves first, but they love God. First chair, it's God first. The second chair, it's self first, but we still love God. What does that mean? That means you say, well, wait a minute. Do those people go to church in the second chair? Absolutely. They go to church all the time unless they want to go to the lake or to the mountains or to the beach. They're there all the time unless their kids are playing club sports on Sunday. Uh, anybody else with me here? Hang in here. I'm only preaching once, so I don't care whether you like this or not, okay? <laughs> you know, you, 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 you can't fire me, so just, just hang in here, all right? All right? And, and, and so see, the second chair, again, we love God. We tell our friends we love God, and we're there all the time unless there's something else that we'd rather do ourselves. Totally different. That's why in America today, 1.5 people, uh, people go to church 1.5 out of four weeks. That's a second chair person. They're there every week unless there's something else they want to do. David had a devoted heart. Solomon, second chair, has a divided heart. And the third chair, Rehoboam, had a dead heart. You know why? He lived for himself only. His heart wasn't open to God at all. It was open to his friends. Now, what I want to do today is try to take different areas of our life and look how this impacts how we work, how we're married, how we raise kids, what we value. All of these things are different between the first and second and third chair. And I want you to see where you are. So what about the first chair? What about the Bible? Well, the first chair obeys the Bible and submits to its authority. The old bumper sticker when I was a kid, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. That's what a first chair person believes. They say, I read God's word, I believe in it, I obey it, and I will submit my life to it. That's why they put God first. The second chair, on the other hand, they respect the Bible and they read it. They don't obey it completely because you see when you're in the second chair, what happens when your lifestyle comes in conflict with the word of God? You rationalize and you go with your lifestyle. Christians living together before they get married. Well, we know it's wrong, but if you're in the second chair, you're going to put yourself first, so you're going to do what you want, so that part of Scripture you're going to put to the side. And so what we do at this point is, if we're not careful, we, we respect it and we read it, but we don't live it. What, what about the third chair? Well, the third chair is not a Christian, but a third chair still owns a Bible. Because everybody in America has got a Bible. I mean, you got to have a Bible on, on, the, on the coffee table. People come over to see you, whether you read it or not. <laughs> and so that's how it is with the Bible. What about our values? What about our values? Well, if the first chair person obeys the Bible and submits to its authority, then the first chair, what? The Bible is their values. Their values come from the Bible, and they are consistent. They're consistent. What about the second chair? Well, the second chair, you see, if we're not careful, our values come from the Bible plus other sources, other sources. And so this person is consistent, but a person, a Christian living in the second chair, we compartmentalize our lives. You say, what do you mean? Well, we have different drawers for different things. So Sunday morning is this drawer, but when I go home from church, I put that back, and how I run my business or, or do my job is another drawer and how I party after work is another drawer. And so what happens, we live inconsistent lives. What about the third chair? Well, the third chair, if we're not careful, the Bible only, the Bible plus, the third chair, we'll take whatever source we can get. Oprah, Dr. Phil, whatever you want to read, man. Uh, whatever they say, we're, we're going to go with it because our goal is to, be, is to look good in the eyes of our friends so we're in the third chair. What happens? We conform. We're consistent. We compartmentalize. In the third chair, we conform. But the Bible warns us 
in Romans 12, don't be conformed to the pattern of the world, but renew your mind. Watch out the way you're thinking. If you're not careful, you go along with everybody else. What about work? If you're a first chair person, work is God's call. And whether you're a stay-at-home mom or a school teacher or a firefighter or a doctor or a own your own business, whatever you are, you see your job as a place to advance the cause of Jesus Christ. And so you say, well, are you in the ministry? Absolutely. We're all in the ministry. Pastors just get to do it full time. We get to be nice all the time, okay? Everybody's in the ministry if you're a first chair. And so you see your job as a place to advance the gospel. Yeah, you're getting paid on the side to take care of your family, but the primary reason you're doing what you're doing is to advance the cause of Jesus Christ. What about the second chair? Well, the second chair is a little different. That's not God's call. If I'm in the second chair, I just want God's blessing. Why? Because I'm in the second chair, God bless my job, meaning give me more financial security. And so we tend to choose this job so that we can have a good retirement, pay our kids to go to college, and enjoy the things that we want to do. We want God's blessing. What about the third chair? Well, the third chair, we don't see it as a calling. We see it as, as a career. It's a stepping stone. And the third chair person that doesn't love Jesus Christ at all, their purpose in work is to what? To get a bigger piece of the pie and move to the upper crust. And so we will change jobs as many times as we can as long as it provides more financial security and more prestige to do what we want to do. All right, hang with me. What about marriage? Here's where it's profound today. Marriage for a first chair person, write down the word covenant. The first chair Christian that submits to God, their marriage is a covenant. My wife and I have a, had a covenant when we got married. We said, we'll, we said we'll never mention the word divorce, and we haven't. She's probably thought of death, but we have never mentioned, <laughs> we, we have, we have never mentioned the word divorce. And so when we've had problems, we know we got to work it out because we're committed. It's a covenant. We, we, we will be true to our vows till death do us part. Sickness of the health, rich or poor, whatever it is. The, the, and guys, I want to say to you, statistics show that the number one key to having a good marriage is that your spouse knows that you will be there for them no matter what happens. It's a covenant. We're in here. But here's where it changes. What about the, the second chair person full of many of our churches this is not a covenant to the second chair person. It is a contract. See, you can't break a covenant, but you can break a contract. How do you break a contract? You're not meeting my needs. You're not making me happy. And if you're not making me happy and meeting my needs, then I'm going to leave you and find somebody else that does. And when they no longer meet my needs and keep me happy, I'll go find somebody else. And so we find that a lot of Christians today, they'll say things like, it blows me away after 20 years of marriage, they will say things like, well, I never really loved him in the first place. Baloney. That's the way you want it out. In fact, you know what breaks my heart today? Some of the highest percentage of divorce is under, is, and you know what age? After they've been married from 25 to 35 years. You know Why? Because all of their life was centered on their kids. We'll talk about that later. And when the kids left home, they turned and looked at each other and they hadn't communicated with each other for years. What about the third chair? For the third chair, marriage is not a covenant. It's not a contract. If anything, it's a convenience. And many people today don't even get married. They just live together. But a lot of people, if you're a non-believer, why in the world would you get married? Because it, it looks better to your peers. It, it's convenience, it puts on a better aura, it looks better, you're more respected in the community. Now hang with me. What about parenting? Boy, here's where it changes. And I want you to know this, this is tough, and you don't have to agree with me on everything and still go to heaven. We're all right, okay? <laughs> but, but I want to tell you how it's changed. I grew up in a time when we were all farm kids, and uh, my dad was in charge. And uh, he said... Uh, we're going to church today, and you got two options. You can either ride or walk. What would you like to do? Okay? And something that breaks my heart today is we have an inverted family structure. 
where the parents aren't in charge, the kids are in charge. And, and too many parents ask your kids, kids, what would you like to do today? Parents, don't do that. It's none of their business. Get in the car, okay? I know that's called abusive and bullying today. My generation, it was called development, okay? You know, uh, that's the way, way, but, you know, turn to the person next to you and say, who cares, old man? We live in a different world uh, uh, today, all right? So I want you to know when we think about parenting, what, what in the world does this mean? I believe people in the first chair put the word confident. They raise confident kids. They're confident. Now, do all their kids turn out always perfect? Absolutely not. But they don't get up every morning and say, I wonder how my kids are going to turn out. I wonder how my kids are going to turn out. Because they've applied biblical principles. And so because they've applied biblical principles and they've lived it, their kids have seen it. Let me stop for a second. You know what? Uh, you know one reason why uh, all my brothers and sisters are, are, are Christians? My whole family is Christian. My wife's family is Christian. Uh, all of my kids, grandkids have accepted Jesus Christ. You know one reason? My parents never asked me to do anything they wouldn't do first. They walk the talk. See, I grew up with almost all of my uh, cousins are alcoholics. Many of them died at a young age. And when my mom and dad got together, they never told us we couldn't drink. They just said, we're not going to do it. And on every family union I went to, I could see the difference. It was obvious. And what I can't understand today, hang with me, is parents that drink constantly, but they tell their kids when they're 17, you can't drink beer in the, in, out of the refrigerator. They go, why? Well, you're a kid. You got to wait until you're 18 or 21. That's inconsistent values. Why would you expect them to live to a higher standard than you? And so I want to say, parents, what you've got to do, if you apply biblical principles, you're confident. Because you're walking the talk, you're not just telling them what to do, you are modeling it. And by the way, I think the greatest teacher of education is not information, it's modeling. And what we need today, if we're going to change this culture for Jesus Christ, we need more moms and dads being willing to live for an audience of one instead of trying to please everybody else. Thanks to both of you. All right. <laughs> They're confident. They apply biblical values. What about this chair? They're hopeful. They're hopeful. They've tried to influence their kids with the Bible, but they've let their kids to be influenced by all kinds of other things as well. Confident, hopeful. Most non-believers today in raising their kids are confused. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to do. And you know one of the greatest times that you can reach your friends for Jesus Christ is when they're going through marriage or family problems. Never miss that. Statistics say today, for example, I know in all of your campuses you're going to invite people to Easter. Be looking at the neighbors and coworkers that are going through family or marriage problems. They are most open to an invitation. Because you see, even though they're in the third chair and they're lost, when everything's going great, they don't think they need the Lord. But when family issues or health issues or marriage issues hit, they are ripe for the gospel. And why is it that sometimes the people you work with, you've invited a church 10 times and they've never come, and somebody else invites them once and they go to their church, is because they happened to invite them at a time when their hearts were open and they were looking. So don't, don't get discouraged. Keep, keep being aware of the people around you and how you can help them. All right, so what's the parenting goal? Anyway, if you're in the first chair, your goal is to raise godly children. Godly children. The key word there is godly. Okay? If you're in the second chair, you see, you want your kids to know and love Jesus Christ. In this chair, if we're not careful, we don't want to raise godly kids. We want to raise good Christian kids. Meaning what? I don't want them to be too radical and really stick out. But I want to be good, good kids. Okay? Don't get in trouble, but don't be weird either. What about the third chair? We want to raise good, successful kids because if you don't know Jesus Christ, the goal for your kids is what? That they, they can make a lot of money and become successful. Now, let me di digress for a couple, time, couple minutes. Hang with me. 
I want you to know as a parent, one of the most difficult decisions I ever made was when my son was between the seventh and eighth grade. My son was a great athlete. I played college basketball, as I said. I coached college basketball before I went into ministry. Turned down a football scholarship to go into ministry. Um, my son is a great athlete. In the seventh grade, uh, we had won the state, won the regional, played in national tournaments. And that summer, we went to Denmark and played in the Dana Cup and beat the German team, whose goalie later became the goalie for the World Cup team from Germany. We played in the Sweden Cup that was the largest tournament in the world. Really good team. And that year, after that summer, we came back, and as before his eighth grade or freshman year, I can't remember which it was, I sat him down and had one of the most toughest toughest talks I've ever had as a parent. And you know what I said? Son, you know that your mom and I love you. We know that we enjoy sports. I was coaching him. But I said, you know what? We're giving you conflicting message. We have said God and the church is most important. But this year, you have missed, you have missed 18 Sundays because you've been playing club soccer, traveling all over the state and all the United States. And I said, I'm going to remove you from soccer. Thank goodness he didn't rebel, okay? Because all of his friends and all the friends' parents told me that I was nuts to do that. But I had to do something in my mind to reinforce the values because when I was saying to him, God's first and the church is first, in reality, missing 18 weeks a year, I was saying to him, soccer's more important than anything. And those are tough calls. And I want you to know, hear my heart, uh, a lot of you got your kids involved in sports because you're convinced they're going to play college scholarships. Most of them aren't. In, in fact, if, if, if I, I can help you out, all the money you've been spending on club sports for 10 years, if you'd invest that in the bank and get interest, your college would be paid for. <laughs> it, it really would. Okay? And here's something else I've noticed. I always played four sports when I grew up, and now when kids play one sport, it blows me away. And they'll get to be about a junior in high school, and they'll get so burnt out, they'll quit. And all of your dreams, if you're not careful, will go down the tube. Because the problem with a lot of our parents is we live vicariously through our kids. Don't do that. Okay? Anyway, that's what I did with him, uh, and, and it, was, it was a difficult time. Okay? Okay? Um, because I want, I want to throw out something else here. Hang with me. At our church, we made a decision that we would reach the men. We'd really target men. You know why? Because I read a statistic that blew, my, blew me away. It said when the child accepts Jesus Christ first, like 5 to 6% to 7% of the time, the whole family comes to Christ. When the mother accepts Christ first and prays God for godly mothers... When the mother accepts Christ, it jumps a little over 20%. The whole family comes to Christ. But we read that, you know what? When the dad accepts Jesus Christ, 93% of the time, the whole family comes to Jesus Christ. Now think about that. And so I said, wait a minute. If, I'm a, if I was a businessman and I would say, what, what should I be targeting? I'd say, I'd be, I'll target the man. And so our church is known for, for reaching men. Uh, hang with me. You don't have to work that hard to reach women in church. Women are more spiritual than men. And most of the things that we do in church appeals to women more than men. The color schemes are feminine, okay? Okay? Uh, the floral arrangements and all the foo-foo stuff. I mean, I went in the bathroom at your church, and I wanted to steal things out of the men's bathroom. I mean... I've never seen a bathroom stocked with that. I wanted to stay in the bathroom and not come to church. It, 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 unbelievable. In fact, so stop and think about this. So we built our new building, and we had beautiful floral arrangements in the lobby, and I noticed that all the women were gathering around uh, talking about all the flower arrangements, and the guys are over in a chair, kind of like when you go shopping at a mall. They try to find the chair to say, when are you going to be done? You know what I mean? And, and I, I thought, something's wrong. I'm going to experiment. So I removed all the floral arrangements, and I put three Harleys in the middle of our lobby for one month, for one month. And you know what happened? The men hung around and talked about those things and each other, and the wives said, let's go home, Okay. I realized for the first time in my life, the Harley was the only visual I had in the church that related to a man. No wonder most of men don't, don't come to church. I, I had to uh, change my whole vocabulary. Because when I asked people to accept Jesus Christ, I would say what? 
Would you like to begin a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? That's feminine. That's, that's not masculine. <laughs> if Benji says to me, Don, I'd, I'd like to have more of a personal relationship with you. <laughs> are, you with, are you with me? Okay. Uh, you say, what do you say? When I invite people to accept Christ, you know what I say? Would you like to begin an adventure with Jesus Christ? Because a woman wants a relationship, a man wants an adventure. You know? That's why women like love stories. Men want to kill, see somebody kill something, okay? <laughs> or, or they want to what? Rescue their, a woman. We want an adventure, all right? Turn the person to you and say, what's it, what's it is it? This is different, all right? All right? So to me, a lot of people say today, hang with me, the problem in the family in America today is men. And that's partially true. Men are not home, divorced. A lot of men have left their families. A lot of men are absent emotionally from their families. But here's the key. If men are the problem to the family in America, women are not the solution. The solution is men. Lost you on that one. Because our culture says women have got to take charge. No, if we men are the problem, then we men have got to step in and be the solution to our family. Okay, let's, let's wrap this up by asking you a few questions. Number one, what chair do you believe are the people most stressed out? Are they most stressed out in the first chair, their lifestyle in the second chair, the third chair? Fourth? I mean, anything, you know? <laughs> okay. First chair? No, they're not stressed out. You know why? They're living their lives according to biblical standards. They're raising their kids that way. They are living life and loving life, and they have purpose and meaning, and they know where they're going. Third chair? Believe it or not, they're not stressed out either. You know why? They're living for themselves. They're going through life. You grab all the gusto you can and enjoy it. Most stressed out people is most people in the church because you see they're stressed out because they're trying to please God and they're trying to please their parents and they're trying to please their kids and they're trying to please everybody else and they don't know what to do. Believe it or not, that's why Many people today that are Christians and go to church, we wonder why our neighbors and the people we work with don't come to church because you're just as stressed out as they are. And your life has nothing of value that they want. On top of that, they say, why in the world, if you're so stressed out and you work five days, would you take one day off and go to a boring dead church where nothing's happening? Now, I don't, boy, I don't... Yeah, hang with me. My wife and I are going through a different time right now because uh, when we stepped down from the church, we basically uh, have been asked to not go there for a year to let our successor build a following, and that's fine. We're okay with that. So I want you to know for the first time in my life, I've had a choice whether I get to go to church or not because the first 18 years of my life, I didn't miss more than two. My mother played every week. My mom and dad went. I've been preaching for 50 years, so I had to go to church, okay? And so the first week I had off, I told my wife, I don't feel like going to church today. <laughs> and she said, I don't either. <laughs> Good marriage, okay? Uh, <laughs> the second week, I said, I don't feel like going to church today. She's more spiritual than I am. She said, well, now, honey, we need, we need to think about that. But I'm in charge. We didn't go. Okay? <laughs> the third week, I felt, I don't care if I go to church either. But you know what? She said, no, we need to go. And I go, you're right. We went to church. So what my wife and I have been doing now for every week, now that I haven't been going to the church that I've been at, pastor for 35 years, we visit churches all over Phoenix. And you know what? I can see why a lot of people don't go to church. They're boring. The sermon's irrelevant. I can't use it on Monday. But you know one thing I've found? Hang with me. And your church is not like that. Most churches that we visit, they're friendly to each other, but they're not friendly to new people. 
And if you want God to bless your church, I talked to a couple people here, on, and, and I already said, hey, why, do you, why do you go to New Hope? And you know what they said? This is a church, immediately when I walked in, there was life, and I could see that people really cared about each other. And I want you to know the danger of a dynamic church is that we come and meet our friends and we huddle in the, in the, in the foyer lobby, whatever you call it, rotunda, and we kind of all are friendly to each other, but be careful because some of those people that maybe something happened in their life and they said, I'm going to give New Hope a chance, and if they come in and walk through the groups and nobody talks to them, they will leave and maybe never turn back to Jesus Christ again. So be aware of that. You have a friendly church, and that's why God, I believe, is blessing you, Okay. Weird pastor, but a friendly church. And that's a formula for success. All right. Now, hang with me. Second question. This is the one as I read the book and watched this study, rocked my world. Which chair do you believe the children end up in? Hang with me. First chair children, or first chair parents, their children end up in the first chair. They saw their parents love and serve Jesus Christ. It was 24-7. It was the real deal. And they said... We're there. Third chair, their kids stayed in the third chair because they raised without, they grew up without Jesus Christ in their home and they seemed to be pretty successful and happy and they said, we're doing okay. What breaks my heart, and I want to tell you because this is so important today, because many of you that call yourselves Christians and you're a part of New Hope on a lot of our campuses, you are living a compartmentalized life. And when your kids see you in the second chair, the studies showed they did not stay in the second chair. Their children grew up and moved to the third chair. You know why? They saw their parents stressed out. They saw their parents preaching one thing but living something else, and they go, wait a minute. And so when they went away to college and maybe heard some more atheistic professors talking about different uh, values, we say in the church what? Our kids go to college and they walk away from the Lord. You know why they walked away from the Lord? It's not always the college. It's because they lived in a home of inconsistency. And they said, our parents aren't Christian. Our parents are religious. Big difference. And they saw that what they believed about Jesus Christ didn't really work Monday through Friday. And they said, why waste our time? So the third question is, what chair are you currently in? What chair are you currently in? Believe it or not, as they researched all of this, they found out that 77% of the people were in the second chair. And my experience when I preached this message in my own church is person after person came out to me and said, Pastor Don, when you started, I thought for sure I was in the first chair. But the more I heard about a lot of things, I realized I'm more in the second chair than I've ever been. And they said more than anything else, I want to get to the first chair. And I want to encourage on all of our campuses, all of you parents, to do everything you can to move to the first chair. Because if you stay in the second chair, your kids will break your heart. And your grandkids, because they will move to the third chair. And my greatest joy, as you heard Benji say, is not that I've been pastor of a large church, but it's the fact that my kids love and serve Jesus, and my grandkids all know Jesus Christ. That is the greatest joy that I have in my life. So if you're in the first chair, what I want you to do, I want you to recommit yourself to staying in the first chair. You are desperately needed. We need models in the church of people that are fully devoted to Jesus Christ. If you're in the second chair, hang in there. What you need to do is repent and realize, you know what? I'm trying to live in two worlds. I'm trying to please God and please myself, and that's not working. And so repentance means I'm going to take, I'm going to walk this way serving myself, and I'm going to repent and turn completely around and say, Lord, I'm going to live for you first more than anything else. Would you repent and move to the first chair? Or maybe there's some of you in all of our campuses today that you've never named Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and it's my prayer that you would receive him. That's God's desire for you, that you would spend an eternity with him. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that if we believe in him, we would not perish, be separated from God, but we would spend eternity with him. And maybe the greatest gift you could give to God today would be to receive him as your Lord 
and your Savior. New Hope, all your campuses, God's called you to be light and salt where you live. And we're not going to get the job done unless we all make a decision to try to move to the first chair and be fully devoted to Jesus Christ more than anything else. Shall we pray? Lord God, thank you for this great church. Thank you for Benji and Amy and the staff and all those that are pouring in to leading people, building up disciples to reach and teach and release. I pray, Lord, that the next couple of weeks that, uh, that that goal of about uh, 400, I think it was, and 78 first-time guests, you just blow that out of the water. Lord, bring at least 1,000 first-time guests that have never heard the gospel to all their campuses that we might reach more and more people with the incredible message of Jesus Christ. And I pray on all of our campuses for all parents, individuals, may we make a decision to look close at where we are in our heart and say, are we, are we playing games? Is it us plus God or is it God first? Help us to honor you and put you first because you gave your life for us. In your name we pray, amen.